Yeah, you may proceed, Shudip, please. Yeah, thank you so much, sir. Am I audible to everyone? Yes. 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 Sir. Yes. Sir. yes sir. Okay. <coughs> okay. Okay. Thank you so much. So, dear participants, very good afternoon and warm greetings of the day. Hope you all are well. First of all, on behalf of Sayyad, we would like to give a special vote of thanks to our honourable resource persons, Professor Ashish Shorkar, for joining with us in this special day to deliver and share his views on cartography and its applications in map making science. Professor Ashish Sharkar is a distinguished academician in the field of the cartography and geomorphology and quantitative geography, urban studies and geoinformatics. Professor Ashish Sharkar sir is a currently as a faculty of Shekham Skills University, West Bengal. He is a visiting faculty of North Bengal University, West Bengal. More than that, sir is a guest faculty of East Calcutta Girls College, Prabhu Jagadbandhu College and Netaji Shubesh, Netaji Shubash Open University. Earlier, sir was an assistant professor of Presidency University. Professor Ashish Sharkar has its 39 plus years teaching experiences and 43 plus years research experiences. Ashish Sharkar sir had been completed his PhD in Urban Geography from University of Calcutta in 1991. Sir was facilitated Presidency College Prize in 1975. Uh, Sir was facilitated in uh, Presidency College Prize 1975. Shubrata Sengupta Model, University of Calcutta 1976. National Col Scholar Prize 1976. Calcutta University Gold Medal 1978. Along with that, Sir has a member of many other prestigious institute and the life fellow of following society like Geographical Society of India, Kolkata. Indian Society of Landscapes Ecology, Acoustics, Kolkata. And Sir was a member of PG Board of Studies, Presidency University, Calcutta University, Netaji Shubash, Open University. So, I uh, again, I, we, uh, again, we facilitated our Sir. So, please, Sir, uh, would you like to, uh, we, li we would like to express you special thanks for joining today. Thank you so much, Sir. Thank you. Thank you. Am I audible? Yes, sir, you are audible. Okay. okay. So, Shudip, uh, you uh, should have you mentioned, should mentioned that I am a retired fellow now, retired, retired from, from West Bengal, Bengal Senior, Senior Education, Education Service. Service. I was actually, I was actually uh, professor, professor and head of geography, of geography from, from, from the Department, Department of Geography, geography Presidency University, University College, College, and later, and later I have retired, I retired from, from the PG the Department, Department of, of Geography of Chandranagar College, College in 2016. And currently acting as a visiting faculty, some part-time faculty, guest faculty, etc. And uh, have a lot of experience in research projects and other things that is available on the internet also. So today, uh, I especially thank the organizer of SIRD to provide me the scope to uh, share my views or rather some experiences about the basics of cartography. It's actually a forgotten subject, uh, what it was in the earlier days. It has now been completely transformed into something else like geospatial technology or geoinformatics, whatever we know about them, uh, uh, about uh, cartography today, digital cartography or something like that.
actually uh, to comprehend the core of geography we need a real time oil design depiction of our habitat economy and society along with the interrelationships that is the maps and cartography is the art and science of map making it certainly involves the depiction of the earth surface convenient reduction through scale factor mathematical principles of transformation of 3d surface onto a 2d plane orientation through relatively fixed reference directions and surveying and that these are done for building the ground control network the easier word for this is the reference map or the base map of a particular place or region number 2 generating the elevation database or t base better known as the topographical maps and then geographical overlaying through thematic data layers what we call them known as thematic maps so map making or uh, simply the mapping refers to all the processes involved in making a map that is collecting data performing the maps design finishing the map for distribution in hard copy or the web thus it is the process of designing compiling and producing maps and the map maker is called a cartographer there is one international body that deals with the, the cartography is known as the international cartographic association inca it defines cartography as the art science and technology of making maps together with their study as scientific documents and works of art including all types of maps plans charts and sections three dimensional models and globes representing the earth or any celestial body at any scale therefore cartography is like a drama played by the two actors the map maker and the cartographer and the map user that is we the scholars and researchers and the practitioners of the geography on the backdrop of two stage properties one is the map and other is the data domain there are four processes of cartography number 1 collecting and selecting the data for mapping manipulating and designing the data followed by designing and constructing the map reading or viewing the map and responding to or interpreting the information to master all these processes a cartographer must be familiar with all mapping activities like geodesy measurement of earth surveying photogrammetry remote sensing and geographic information systems actually a map communicates a huge body of information about the earth surface and the degree of effectiveness to communicate such information is called the map efficiency it puts equal emphasis on both map making and map using in fact it is the job of a map designer to enhance the map user's ability to retrieve the required information and the user must understand the intricacies of mapping processes however the real changes comes in thematic mapping where the goal is to create a general impression of the phenomenon's spatial distribution therefore the mapping process involves a series of information transformation each of which can alter the appearance of a final map beginning with data collection the information is distorted through several filters like ground survey sensors remote sensing or compilation procedures always some kind some amount of data is lost or distorted mapping further modifies the information through again cartographic abstraction what is that selection particular thing that is selected for mapping classification of the information simplification of the details exaggeration and symbolization so what is a map a map is a graphic representation of the milieu that includes 
all aspects of physical and cultural environments and even people's attitudes or perceptions. Therefore, maps are described as models of reality. It is actually a two-dimensional scale model of the earth surface and is the most spectacular medium of cartographic communication through graphic languages to the satisfaction of the geographers and the cartographers. There are three intrinsic and fundamental aspects while presenting a multiplex of information through maps. Number one, locations. That is, the positions in a 2D space, such as places with coordinates x, y. Attributes at locations, for example, elevation, rainfall, temperature, language, any kind. And number three, the special relationships between am among them. Maybe among locations, maybe among attributes at one location, maybe among the locations of the attributes of a given distribution, or among the locations of derived or combined attributes of given distributions. Therefore, maps are tangible graphic representations of that surface, says cultural and physical environment. It is simply a storehouse of geographic information in the spatial format and spatial language. It is used for spatial forecasting and spotting trains, as well as to visualize what otherwise would be invisible. It is designed for analytical purposes involving measuring and computing all sorts of topological and metric properties of relationships and therefore serve as a useful device of spatial analysis. It helps stimulate actually spatial thinking. It functions therefore as a scientific tool for developing a geographical hypothesis. Thus, it is a very powerful tool for spatial analysis. And as our society is growing more complex, the needs and uses of maps of all kinds have increased. Nations, states, districts, panchayat shamitis, gram panchayat, municipalities, and other planning agencies use them for plotting environmental and resource data. Actually, maps lie at the heart of a cartographer, geographer who understands the spatial perspective of the physical environment. Geographers have the necessary skills to abstract and symbolize the features of the earth surface. He is actually skillful in selecting the map projection and the mapping and understanding of aerial relationships. He has a thorough knowledge of the importance of scale to the final presentation of spatial data. Interestingly, maps are the principal tools of a geographer and again also the product of the geographers who are naturally cartographers. Maps language is, the, is a distinctive language of geography. Therefore, sophistication in map reading and composition and the ability to translate between the language of maps, words, and numbers, these are fundamental to the study and practice of geography. Professor Gartner, a great uh, contemporary cartographer, he says, starting as a geographer and cartographer, dealing with details on how to deal with signs, graphic variables, and modeling the syntax of the cartographic language, I have evolved into becoming interested in the meaning of this form from a mere semantical perspective and finally end up in being interested in the enormous power and potential of the pragmatic dimensions of cartography. Thus, understanding maps not only as a collection of signs and graphics, but that these signs carry a specific meaning for a particular human being or community in a particular situation and thereby leading to an immersive way of human communication. Now, I am trying to present
some interesting slides. Can you see this? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The, the five fundamental special relations intrinsic to a map are number one, direction. That is the orientation associated with the line of sight from a particular point. Number two, distance or the physical separation between points in space, which is very important in the geographical analysis because spatial interaction usually declines with distance. This reminds us the first law of geography, Tobler's first law of geography. That is the first time a law has been attributed to geography by Waldo Tobler. It goes like this. Everything is related to everything else, but near things are more related than the distant things. That means relationship reciprocally varies with distance. Number three, connectiveness or the relative location, contiguity, adjacency that exists among cartographic objects. Number four, a neighborhood that exists around any object containing other elements that are in some way connected to it. It is very important in special analysis because events at one object often influences events at neighboring objects. And number five, absolute location or the physical position of a point defined by a metric irrespective of the location of any other point. And there are seven fundamental principles or the laws of cartography or map making. These seven principles are important and these are very important for those who make maps for special analysis, for visualization or anything else. Number one, maps are drawn on a predetermined scale. That means there must be a scale. Scale bears the relationship between the corresponding distances between two points on map and the two points on the earth surface. Second, maps are selective. Only those features that are relevant and important for the map are shown. Number three, maps emphasize certain of the selected features. Some of the features are selected emphasized either through lettering or through color. Maps are symbolized. All features are shown by standardized symbols that are characteristically meant to portray nominal, ordinal, interval, or ratio data. Maps are generalized. Intricate detail is simplified, particularly on small scale maps. And maps are always lettered titled and labeled for the users. And maps are usually related to a system of parallels and meridians. That means maps must be drawn based on some kind of the principles of transformation. Transformation of 3D features on the earth surface, 3D surface of the earth surface onto a 2D plane. And this Transformative principles are known as map projections. So how many types of map? There are many kinds of map that may be drawn. Based on the attributes of visual and tangible reality, maps are primarily of two types. One is real map. That is any cartographic product that is directly viewable and permanent. For example, conventional sheet map, globe, orthophoto map, machine drawn map, a plastic relief map, and block diagrams. And number two, the virtual map. And this virtual map, they are of, may be subdivided into three different types. 
virtual map one it is directly viewable as a cartographic image but has only a transient tangible reality for example maps displayed on a cathode ray tube fall in this category a cft map image refresh storage tube plasma panel cognitive map or two dimensional map virtual map 2 these have a permanent reality but cannot be directly viewed as a cartographic object as spatial data recorded on a hard copy medium like paper but not as a cartographic image fall in this category the for example gazetteer anaglyph traditional field data stored hologram stored fourier transform and laser disk data and number 3 virtual map 3 these are neither visual or not tangible digital images on magnetic disks and tapes fall in this category digital memory data magnetic disk or tape data video animation digital terrain model and cognitive map with relational geographic data <coughs> so these real maps are certainly a combination of analog and symbolic models for example a traditional thematic map consists of two important components a geographic base map these two maps you see the geographic base map containing comprising the boundaries scale and the north line and the system of parallels and meridians and a thematic overlay that means in the first map a disparity index has distribution has been shown and the second map component score has been shown only a single thing these are non-spatial attributes of the features being mapped the geographic base map is an analog model because the cartographic forms are similar to the real world patterns but different scale and the thematic overlay is a symbolic model because an abstract language such as shape patterns shade patterns or the line patterns represent it again based on scale or elaborateness of representation of ground details maps may be divided into four different types small scale maps medium scale maps large scale maps and plans small scale maps example wall maps and atlas map medium scale map district map state map uh, country map million sheet degree sheet and quadrant sheet large scale maps for example, topographical maps and cadastral maps, and plans, campus plans, site plan, building plan, etc. And based on functions, there are three distinct classes of maps. Number one, general reference map. Number two, thematic maps. And number three, charts. So these general reference maps show the locations of a variety of different features, such as administrative boundaries, forests, water bodies, transport lines, settlements, and others. These are multi-purpose maps showing all kinds of information. Sir, huh? uh, sir, sorry to interrupt you. Actually, in slide share mode, there has some problem in Google Meet. Uh, the slide is not showing changes. So you have uh, just... No, that's I'm, not why changing, I am, I'm not changing the slides now. Oh, what else? So the same okay. slide is there. Same, same. This thing. Okay, okay. Fine, you fine, should fine, understand fine. this thing. <laughs> Thank okay. you, sir. Sorry. Uh -huh. okay. So, large scale general reference maps are called the topographical maps. It depicts as much of the features of a particular area as is possible within the scale constraints. The contextual items are shown as marginal notations and a standard legend fixed by the International Cartographic Association. These maps have greater accuracy in positional relationships and are largely used for site location and other engineering projects, like this one. These are the different classes of maps. The thematic maps are single purpose maps as they concentrate on the spatial distribution of a single phenomena or the relationship between phenomena. They are used to explore the 
special structure of a given distribution. The whole character as consisting of the interrelationships of the parts. On such maps, it is customary to place explanatory items and contextual notes such as titles, legends, and insect within the map frame itself. Mind that, within the map frame itself. Maps wire and steel are drawn by manual means using a variety of hand equipments like drawing board with clips, set squares, compass, divider, protractors, rulers, diagonal scale, French curve, pencils, erasers, etc. But nowadays, maps are digitally drawn on computers and hard copies can be extracted from as many copies as desired from the plotters or printers. So they use softwares, ArcMap, ArcGIS, Desktop, ArcIMS, Address Emerging, NV, Geomedia, MapInfo, QGIS, Graphad, AutoCAD, MicroStation, Whitebox, Saga, etc. Et and what are charts? Charts are specially designed maps that serve the needs of the navigators, both nautical and aeronautical. There is a uh, saying is that like this, maps are to be looked at while charts are to be worked on. We work on charts to find something and then look at maps to understand something. On charts, navigators plot their courses, determine their positions, mark bearings and so on. Nautical charts include sailing charts for navigation in open waters, general charts for visual and radar navigation, offshore using landmarks, coastal charts for near shore navigation, harbor charts for use in harbors or anchorage and small craft charts. All these show such features as sounding, coasts, shoal waters, lights, buoy, and radio aids. Their scales vary depending upon the detail necessary. Charts are normally designed to show accurate locations and to be easy to read and to mark on. Aeronautical charts are of two types. Number one, those used for visual flying and those for instrument navigation. So it is very rare to find pure general reference maps, thematic maps and charts. Mostly, com they combine functions to a certain extent. For example, green shades on a topographical sheet show distribution of forested areas. The representation of terrain by contours shows landforms. Thus, general reference maps may have thematic components. On the other hand, most thematic maps include boundaries, towns, rivers, and other basic reference information. Therefore, they have general purpose as well as thematic functions. Charts, they are more likely to have one specific function and are mainly thematic. That is, there is no limit to the number of classes of maps that can be created by grouping them based on certain criteria. So the location and elevation database of the surface features of the art in general reference maps and topographical maps, they are obtained by ground surveying and leveling. And the thematic maps are produced by overlaying the thematic data layers on the already prepared base map. So in the ancient period, maps were made by using accurate surveying techniques, which measures the positions of various objects by calculating the distance and angles between each point. The surveying tools, the surveying tools they used by a series of ropes and chains that were cut to known lengths, and they used physical or magnetic compasses to measure their lengths. And if they when they wanted to measure angles between points that are farther away from each other, they used magnifying glasses, small telescopes that were attached to the compass. In the modern period, almost similar things, but with more sophistication, like chains, compass, sextant, optical square, a variety of 
levels, theodolites, plane tables, and so on. By this time, there have been great advances in trigonometry, especially spherical trigonometry, geodesy, field astronomy, and the like. And today, in the postmodern period, map is made using the te geospatial technology like remote sensing, GIS, GPS, spatial statistics, computer hardware, and computer software. And the most important processes in ground surveying were triangulation. Triangulation was used to determine the location of a certain point by using the location of other known survey markers or points. By this, distances, elevations, and directions between objects can be measured even from long distances. The whole ground was used to be divided into different uh, into a number of triangles of varying size and shapes. And by finding the length of the baseline that is fixed and the angles with respect to a third point or the uh, a, um, or a particular uh, as triangle, we can solve the distances and plot the triangle ABC. If we calculate from the measurements the angle of these two, then I can find the angle this. So ang summation of these three angles of a triangle must be 180 degree. Then another check is that this area, we can easily find out the area of this triangle from the length of the sides of the triangle or using length of the two sides and the intervening angle. This way, the whole area has been divided into different a number of triangles. And finally, the distance JK that is measured and check the whole thing, trigonometrically. It all started at, toward the end of the 18th century, actually. The Great Triangulation Survey of India started in 1801. It had a huge scientific impact because it was one of the first accurate measurements of an entire section within an arc of longitude. It was also the first time they were able to measure the geodesy anomaly. The Piri Reis map was made in 1513 from pieces of military intelligence by Piri Reis, who was an admiral and cartographer from the Ottoman Empire. It was made from a collection of maps that were available at that time. And today, only a third of it is still intact. I'll show you while discussing some of the uh, cartographic developments in the ancient period. Now, how to, to map the earth? We must take some measurements about the earth. For elementary purpose, uh, we take earth as a sphere, although it is not. The Earth is approximately a sphere rotating on its polar axis and the complete rotation takes 24 hours. It is not a regular sphere, slightly flattened at the ends of its axis of rotation. These two ends, that the points at which the axis of rotation meets the surface of the sphere, they are termed as the poles. The North Pole is defined by that end and the zenith of which twinkles the pole star and the South Pole marks the other end. And the imaginary circle that circumscribes the sphere being equidistant from the poles, such as the plane of circle passes through the center, is called the equator. This is the equator. The plane of the equator passes through the center of the earth. Thus, the equator is a great circle and divides the earth into two equal halves or hemispheres. The axis of the Earth's rotation perpendicularly passes through the equatorial plane at the center. The angle here is always 90 degrees. And between the equator and the pole, circles of varying radius are drawn on the sphere with centers on the axis of rotation. These are the circles, small circles. And the radius of the small circles gradually decreases from equator towards the pole, and pole is exactly equal 
to a point. These are all uh, parallel to themselves and parallel to the equator. That is why they are called small circles, sometimes parallels of latitude or simply parallels. And the great circles passing through the poles and perpendicular to the equator, passing through the poles and perpendicular to the equator are called meridians or the lines of longitudes. They have all meridians are equal in size and the planes of all the meridians pass through the center of the earth. Therefore, they are all parts of great circles. Two complementary meridians always form a complete great circle. And of these, the one that passes through Greenwich is called the prime meridian. Location of the on the earth surface. The location of a point on the earth surface, it is determined with respect to an imaginary surface reference framework constituted by a fixed pair of mutually intersecting perpendicular lines. In case of our earth, the horizontal axis is the equator and the vertical axis is the prime meridian. And the coordinate values corresponding to the y-axis are called latitudes or the phi, while the axis of values corresponding to the x-axis is called the longitudes or the lambda. These define the geographical coordinate of a place on the earth's surface, P, lambda, phi. And the coordinate frame is formed by equator and the prime meridian. Such coordinates can easily be transformed into rectangular and polar with the help of mathematical principles. For example, x is a function of lambda and y is a function of obviously latitudes or phi and d is the distance between this is the polar coordinate system, this is the origin point and this is the point p. So this distance op is d. It is both a function of longitude and the function of latitude. Similarly, z is the angle or the direction from the north and z is also a function of x or lambda and y or phi. This d, z, x, y, they are all interrelated through mathematical transformations. x equal to d tan z, d sin z and y equal to d cos z. We can find out from this right angle triangle. And obviously, d equal to square root of om square plus pm square or square root of x square plus y square. And j is equal to tan inverse x divided by y. It's a simple formula. And the latitude of a place is the vertical angle phi subtended by the place at the center of the sphere on an equatorial plane. This is the point P. This is the circle through P parallel circle and this is the angle made by this point of the parallel circle at the center of the earth on the equatorial plane that is equal to phi. This is called the latitude of the place P. And the lines joining, it is measured, sorry, it is measured either to the north or south of the equator and are designated as degrees north or degrees south. Lines joining points of the same latitude trace circles on the surface of the earth called parallels, other way around. The north pole is designated as 90 degree north and south pole is 90 degree south, obviously. And zero degree parallel designates the equator. So until 1600, the earth was thought to be a perfectly sphere. But as the earth is a rotating body, Newton, with the help of the theory of gravity, proved that it is a bulging at the equator and slightly flattened at the pole with an eccentricity of 1 by 300. The, the shape of the 3D figure of the earth is oblate ellipsoid or oblate spheroid. This polar flattening or ob obliteness is given by f equal to 1 minus b by a and the eccentricity is given by e equal to square root of 1 minus b square by a square. This b and a <laughs> equatorial radius of the earth a and this is the polar radius of the earth b. Till now, there are at least 20 determinants, determinations of the size and shape of the earth with varying degrees of flattening and eccentricity. Of this, 11 measurements are given below. They differ by some fractions only in case of flattening 
and radius by a couple of meters or a couple of feet like this Everest 1830 Airy 1830 and then Bessel 1841 Clark 1866 Clark 1880 International 1924 Krasovsky 1940 Australian 1965 WGS 72 1972 GRS 80 1980 and wgs 84 1984 these are the values 6377276.3 and this 6377 say 78137.0 some thousands of meters if there is a difference and this polar 6356075 6356752 this is the flattening one one by 300.8 and this is the flattening one by 298.257 Actually, till now, we have not been able to find out exact shape of our Earth. Some call this is geoid. This is the semi-major axis and the semi-minor axis. This is A, this is B. This is the center of the circle that touches the maximum portion of the body. So, center of Earth's mass is like this, positioned here. In this diagram, this is the center of the mass and this is the center of the ellipsoid of the spheroid. There is a difference between the two. Obviously, geoid represents the mean sea level and this portion obviously geoid doesn't fit very well. And this is the ellipsoid or the spheroid. It fits well towards the southern, southern hemisphere. So WGS-84 used the satellite observations and now we adopted in most of the countries of the world. However, cartographers still use a sphere of same surface area as the ellipsoid called an orthalic sphere. And the measurements are used as radius 6371 kilometer or 3959 miles with a circumference of 400, uh, 40,030.2 kilometers or 24,875.1 mile. And these are the standard measurements on the spherical earth. But for all practical classroom purposes, we take the mean radius of the earth as 6400 kilometer or 640 million centimeter or 4000 miles or 25 250 million inches. These are the measurements taken for classroom purposes. So what are longitudes? The longitude of a place is defined as the horizontal angle between the meridional plane passing through that place and that of the prime meridian at the center of the equatorial plane. It is measured either to the east or west of the prime meridian. Supposing this is the prime meridian and this is the uh, meridian passing through our desired point this it lies at phi latitude and the meridional planes of the two places Greenwich and this place they meet at the um, center of the earth on the equatorial plane make an angle lambda so this is lambda degree east as because this place is located toward the east of the Greenwich Meridian. In this way, we imagine or divide the earth into uh, a number of meridians and we calculate the location of the place in terms of the longitudes of that meridians. And all the meridians, they are half circles and converge either at the North Pole or at the South Pole. The prime meridian determines the proper eastern and western hemisphere. As the equator divides the earth or the globe into two north and southern hemisphere, and the prime meridian and this complementary meridian 180 degree that divides the earth into two, again two hemispheres, one is eastern hemisphere and another is western hemisphere. By latitude and longitude, we determine always we show the location of a particular place that this place has this much of longitudes and this much of latitudes 
lambda phi. That is the general expression of location. Now the concept of map projection. Why this is map projection is needed? To establish the position of a geographic location on a map. A map projection is used to convert geodetic coordinates to plane coordinates on a map. It projects the datum ellipsoidal coordinates and height onto a flat surface of a map. The datum, along with the map projection applied to a grid reference locations, establishes a grid system for plotting locations. The common map projection today we use almost universally is the transverse marketer based on which there are several systems of uh, grids have been prepared and used by different nations. One is universal transverse marketer grid, military grid reference system, United States national grid system, global area reference system, and world geographic reference systems. And the coordinates on a map are designated usually normally in terms of northings and eastings. And obviously map projections have different kinds of transformation involving different mathematical principles and different formulas are applied. So why use a map projection? It is because a projection permits spatial data to be displayed in a Cartesian system and projections simplify the calculation of distances and areas. So P is a point on a 3D globe. Geographical coordinate, lambda phi. Spherical coordinate, theta. R. And P dash is the transformed point on a 2D plane with rectangular coordinate xy, polar coordinate rho z. Therefore, the transformation equation functions are x equal to function of f1 lambda phi, y is a function of lambda phi, rho is a function of theta r, and z is a function of theta r. All these functions f1, f2, f3, f4, they are real, single valued, continuous, and differential functions of longitudes and latitudes. So this is the earth, reduced earth. And these are the projection planes or developable surfaces. With the help of this, we produce this kind of projections. No flat representation of earth can be completely accurate because when a three-dimensional body is represented on a two-dimensional plane, there occurs a reduction in one dimension. Obviously, there will be distortions in different components. In fact, four different components, area, angle, distance, and direction. Accordingly, map projections can be divided into four different types based on these properties. One is one group is equalidia projections, or they are orthalic or homolographic or equivalent, as because they preserve only area. There are orthomorphic projections that are true shape or conformal projections that preserve only the shape of the area, not other things. And there are equidistant projections that maintain only the distance between the points and azimuthal projections that direction of the bearings from the center of the projection of any point. So no projection can preserve all four properties simultaneously. Although there are some combinations are possible. For example, area and direction, zenithal equal area projection. Sorry. Zenithal equal area projection. or genital stereographic projection, that means shape and distance. But no projection can preserve both area and angles. The map maker must decide which property is most important and choose a particular projection based on that. So basics of map projection, what are these? Every projection has its own set of advantages and disadvantages. 
there is no such thing as best projection distortions in shape scale distance direction area always occur and some projections minimize distortions in some of these properties at the expense of maximizing errors in others and some projections are attempts to only moderately distort all these properties the map picker must select the one best suited to his needs reducing distortions of the most important features they have devised almost limitless ways to project the image of the globe onto a flat surface so every map user and make map maker should have a basic understanding of the map projections to create spatial data or the gps data and important to the gis and overlay with our layers acquire spatial data from other sources and display the gps data using maps so these are very very important for mapping so there are different classes of map projections this is the art it is first transformed into a generating globe and from generating globe we produce the maps so it's a two step process and this is called the map scale represent the fraction globe distance divided by arc distance and on mock projections the map distance divided by globe distance so there are basically four different uh, three different kinds of uh, physical models through which they are produced one is cylindrical projection a cylinder is taken as the developable surface and that may be placed tangentially or uh, normally or obliquely like this these are the planar group of projections this is the normal case this is the equatorial case the plane touches at, at the uh, pole plane touches at the equator and the plane touches in between pole and the equator this is the cylindrical case this is the normal case of the cylinder as the cylinder touches the globe along the equator this is the transverse case cylinder touches the globe along the pole and this is the oblique case and the graticule obviously takes different shapes and this is the conical projections this is the normal conical projections this is the equatorial case of conical projections and this is the oblique case of conical projections all kinds of things we can do with and play with map projections there are limitless numbers of map projections so coordinate systems on 3d earth the coordinate is given by longitude latitude and altitude same is on the spheroid or ellipsoid on 2d plane the cartesian coordinate is uv the polar coordinate is dz and the rectangular coordinate is xy so projection it is from phi lambda lambda phi to xy the transformation will be like this cylindrical projection meridians and parallels intersect at 90 degree often these are conformal projections and least distortion along the equator because the cylinder touches the globe generating globe along the equator no distortion at all but at we, as we go toward the pole there occurs distortions examples platicary marketer goals etc this is the net of platicary projection and this is the net of lambert cylindrical equilibrium projection this is miller cylindrical projection the globe appears like this and this is gauls orthographic projection and gauls stereographic projection the principles are all different this maintains the shape and this maintains the area and now the transverse marketer projection which is very important to understand because we use utm for utm grids so this is the way the cylinder touches this is the transverse marketer projection this is the oblique marketer projection when it touch the cylinder cylinder is it touches the globe along the pole so that this area can be truly preserved in normal case this shape of the area 
is distorted toward the i uh, sorry um, the 90 degree up to 90 degree we cannot plot on market or projection because the tan functions becomes infinity so up to a certain degree only we can use market or projection to map the earth so this cylinder is rotated 90 degrees so that the line of contact is a central meridian universal transverse marketer uses this kind of projection this is planar projection that is a plane is used that touches the globe either along the equator or in between or at the pole and that they preserve azimuth or the direction from the center center of projection this is the center of projection and this is the center of projection mnemonic chart is prepared based on this and in ancient times the mnemonic chart was used for navigation by the navigators we can plot the celestial hemisphere onto this kind of project planar projections we can also produce stereograms to use the distribution of deep and strike of different series of rock formations. This is an azimuthal equidistant projection, equatorial projection, azimuthal equal area, equatorial case. This is the azimuthal equal area, polar genus. These are just examples to show you. Now, conical projections. Most accurate along the standard parallels. What are standard parallels? The parallels along which a cone touches the globe that there the, along this line there will be least distortion or no distortion at all the standard parallels are also known as line of zero distortions meridians radiate out from the vertex of the pole that means even the pole vertex of the cone even the pole has a radius these are very poor in poor to represent the polar radius just omit those areas and the temperate latitude is mainly projected using this kind of projections. And there are various types of conical projections as well. Conical equidistant projection, Lambert's conical equality of projections, Albert's conical equality of projections, Euler projection, Brown's projection, conical orthomorphic projection, and then American polyconic projection, rectangular polyconic projection, then Warner's projection, bones projection then there is a projection a series of projections called compromise projections for example robinson's world projection it is based on a set of coordinates rather than a mathematical formula shape area distance are okay near origin and along equator this is neither conformal projection nor equivalent projection useful only for world maps then there is another projection, good Sobolo sign projection. These are used to show distributions of economic resources over the earth's surface. So when you try to map only the oceans of the earth or the continents of the earth's surface, no one particular uh, projection is suitable for this if we take contiguously all the meridians. So we need to interrupt the meridians and we call this along the central meridians of course these are called interrupted projections this is a case of interruptions to show the oceans only this is indian ocean this is for pacific ocean and this is for atlantic ocean and this kind of interruption is used to show the distribution of the continents and there are also other interesting projections like this just take a look buckminster's fullest demaxion this is cassini's projection brown's stereographic cylindrical projection this is sinusoidal projection this is molite projection another equal area projection this is collignon diamond projection that is its shape is like a diamond this is quartic Orthalic projection, another equal area projection. This is McBride Thomas Poor projection. In some way, one is distinguished from the other in terms of either shape or area or the azimuth or the distance. This is a cut four projection. 
This is Robinson's projection. This is good Somolo sign projection. It's a combination of two different projection, two different projection. And this is box eumorphic projections. This is Winkle two projection, Wishel's projection of the two poles. Just see the shape of the meridians. This is Hammer's Atops projection, and this is Hammer's projection. They are close friends. This is Wagner's nine projection, and Acre Griffin drops projection. This is Winkle triple projection. This is Lagrange's projection. Everybody used to portray the earth most uh, to satisfy their own needs, what they wanted to project for their own purpose. This is Eisenlohr projection. And this is August projection. The shift is completely different. They are closely to one another, of course. This is Pace's quinquential projection. See, this is equator. Equator is like square. So that you can easily just break or fold the projection into some boxes. This is Goyu projection and this is Adam's projection. The shape of the meridians, the shape of the parallels, they all differ from one another. This is Jaraxxus world projection. See the shape. Van der Gritten's third projection and Van der Gritten's fourth projection. As because this area, if we take this area as sorry. This polar area, this is very much distorted. And this is nearly maintains the area. This is Maurer globular projection, and this is orthopsidal projection. This is oblique hammers projection, Arden close projection, Westminster's projection. Actually, in our days, when we studied cartography special paper in MSc, we have drawn this kind of projections in our special paper. And this is interrupted sinusoidal projection for showing the continents and this is for showing the oceans. Peterman's projection and this is Jagger's projection. Burghaus's projection of three different kinds. This is triangular in shape or rather uh, tetrahedral in shape and this is pentagonal in shape and this is a diamond shaft. Convalactic projection, Maurer's S231 projection and Maurer's S233 projection theory all pentagonal. pentagonal. And it's like a butterfly. This is a tetrahedral projection. And see, the tetrahedral theory of the origin of the earth. These are the meridians that divide the hedron of the surface into two different things. Continents are located along these meridians, along these meridians. These are some examples of interrupted projection. First one is Molloid projection. Second one, good somolo sign projection. And third, Boggs eumorphic projections. Health states projection, one is composite world projection and it is simple projection. That means it is along the equator, but it depicts the world into one particular sheet. This is tetrahedral globe. This is octahedral projections. Octa means eight, drawn means plane. So there are eight planes. Butterfly projections, Kyle's. These are Waterman's projection. It's also like a butterfly. 
nomonic projection on a cuboco tetrahedron. Nomonic projection on icosahedron. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 10 hedrons or planes are there. Snyder's polyhedral projection. Snyder is the most recent cartographer who has developed also a number of projections. This is one polyhedral projection. And this is nomonic projection on a dodecahedron. This is rhombico bow octahedral projection. And there are map foldouts like this trapezoidal projection, Ortelius projection, APN projection, Nicolosi projection, octant projection, marketer projection. Oblique marketer projection. We have already seen the transverse marketer projection. And now the UTM system. This needs to be explained because this is used today in softwares and electronic chart preparations. This is the transverse marketer projection. In this, actually, it's not a single map projection, but a series of 60 projections because it divides the earth into 60 zones of 6 degree longitudinal band. This zone 1 corresponds to 180 degree to 174 degree west, zone 1, the westernmost. This is zone 1, and this is the 60th zone. Okay, and it covers longitude 174 degrees to 180 degrees and the polar region south of 80 degrees south and north of 84 degrees north is excluded, mind that. Beyond 84 degrees north and beyond 80 degrees south is not included in the UTM projection. For this, another special kind of projection is used which is known as Universal Polar Stereographic Projection or UPS projection. So each of these zones, they use transverse marketer projection. This, this is the six degree of longitude and this is the central meridian. Therefore, this area, this distance is approximately the same with that of the earth. And these are the zones latitudinal bands here. They are placed at different intervals, 8 degree intervals. And from 80 to 90 degree, uh, sorry, 64 to 72 degree and 72 to 84 degrees. Last one is 12 degrees interval. So, each of these zones use a transverse market projection that map a large north-south extent with a low distortion. Using narrow zones of 6 degree of longitude, that is 668 kilometer in width, and reducing the scale factor along the central meridian to 0 0.9996. That is a reduction of only 1 is to 2500. The amount of distortion is below 1 in 1000 in each zone. Scale increases to actually near the equator 1 is to 1 0, 1 .0010. Therefore, it is conveniently maintains the shape of the place of, of, part, of a particular within that zone. In each zone, the scale factor of the central meridian reduces the diameter of the transverse cylinder to produce a second projection with two standard lines or the lines of true scale about 180 kilometer on each side of or about parallel to the central meridian. This is arcos 0.996 means 1.62 degrees at the equator. The scale is less than one inside the standard parallels and greater than one outside them but the overall distortion is minimized. That is why UTAB is used. Each zone is segmented into 20 latitude bands 
each latitude band is 80 degree high and is lettered from C at 80 degree south and increasing half the English alphabet until X. But mind that the letters I and O are <coughs> omitted and not used. The last latitude band X is extended an extra four degrees. So it aims at 84 degrees north latitude, thus covering the northernmost land on Earth. Latitude bands A and B do exist, as do bands Y and Z. They cover the western and eastern side of the Antarctic and Arctic regions, respectively. The letter A is the first letter of the northern hemisphere. So any letter coming before N in alphabet is in the southern hemisphere. And any letter N or after is in the northern hemisphere. A position on the earth is given by UTM zone number and the easting and the northing of the planar, co uh, planar coordinate pair in that zone. This is the way the UPS is defined, uh, sorry. In the northern hemisphere, positions are measured northward from zero at the equator. The maximum northing value is about 9.3 million meters at 84 degrees north. That's the north end of UTM zone. And in the southern hemisphere, northing decreases southward from the equator, set at 10 million meter or about 1.1 million meter at 80 degrees south, the south end of the UTM zone. For the southern hemisphere, its northing at the equator is set at 10 million meter. So no point has a negative northing value. That means while projecting using this, we use a false coordinates. A location at 22 degree 51 minute 47 second north and 88 degree 21 minute 22, 21 second east lies in longitude general zone 45, latitude band Q and the grid position is given by 639096.76 east and 2528999 meter north. And now, this is the UPS projection, Universal Polar Stereography Coordinate System. This east zone is Z and west zone Y. And this is zone A. This is the south polar area. This is the north polar area. And this is west zone A and East John B. It uses WGS 84 latitude a system, latitude longitude. The total grid system is divided into this kind of places. And the system location of this degree north and this degree east is given by this ZGG79, something like this. And there are um, softwares to convert any latitude in any form, either in uh, decimal or in degrees, minutes, seconds into UTM coordinates or polar stereographic coordinates, anything like that. There are softwares uh, when these are put in, into this, they give you the coordinates in detail. And it's very difficult for us to calculate this as because if anybody doesn't know the complex equations of geodesy, it is not possible to calculate or use those formulas to personally manipulate the, with the help of a calculator, the values. So lastly, I'm going to discuss some uh, phases of the evolution of cartography. The activity of map making Actually, it has a long history. And basically, it is tied to the history of human civilization. And obviously, it followed, like any other subject, as a tree branching model. Early maps were often figurative than literal. And the mappers commonly chose something other than physical space to structure their environmental representations. And most of these lacked spatial fidelity and are probably used for ceremonial or ritual purposes. However, some are practical applications like this. These are called stick charts. 
Polynesian Islanders, they used this or prepared this. These are maps. Actually, they use this to show the locations of islands in different directions with the help of sticks. This is the coastline or something like that. These are different kinds. These are all the islands. They used to travel on open sea and to find out their islands, they produced these thick charts. And uh, actually the oldest recorded route uh, that we have evidence is a nine feet wall painting found in 1963 of a town plan showing buildings and a volcano found in Anatolia dated back 6100 to 6300 BC. So it is also known the early representation of maps and routes by old Egyptians on papyrus. But uh, there are very little evidences, few evidences made it to our time. Everything has been lost through the different phases of civilization. And at that time, maps become more famous than their makers. Many cartographers actually become famous for their contribution to the art and science of cartography after they have created a masterpiece. Others become famous then create equally famous works for royalty, nobility, or well-known explorers of their time. And there are some who made a famous map, then disappeared from history forever. And throughout history, there are five maps that have been particularly noteworthy. I'll come to this. This is Babylonian world map. History's earliest known world map. And that's this star-shaped map, see, this is drawn on a clay tablet, on a clay tablet. And just five by three inches, its size, shows the world as a flat disk surrounded by an ocean or bitter river. This Babylon and the Euphrates River are depicted in the center as a pair of rectangles, this as a pair of rectangles. While the neighboring cities of Assyria and Susa are shown as small circular blobs. These are small circular blobs. Outside the disk sit a collection of triangular wedges that depict far off islands with mysterious labels such as beyond the flight of birds and a place where the sun cannot be seen. These are triangular pieces. The accompanying cuneiform text describes these unknown lands as being populated by mythological beasts that suggests that the map shows both real geographical features and elements of Babylonian cosmology. So ancient cartography, it was practically um, the Greek civilization that helped to develop enormously the understanding of cartography as an important science for the society in general. Ptolemy, Herodotus, Anaximander, Eratosthenes, all had tremendous influence on Western art sciences, including geography. They performed a deep study of the size and shape of the earth and its habitable areas, climatic zones, and country positions. And Anaximander, he was the first to draw a map the known world, while Pythagoras speculated about the notion of the spherical earth with a central fire at the core. When the geographers of the Greek era started estimating scientifically the circumference of the earth, a huge impulse was given to the cartographic science. And during the Roman period, actually, the social contributions were failed. Cartographers focused on practical uses, military and administrative needs. Their need to control the empire in the financial, economic, political, and military aspects made evident the need to have maps of administrative boundaries, physical features, and road networks. Until we have the administrative boundary or the physical features or the road networks, how can we 
administer or impose administration on my empire. Roman maps are more or less restricted to the area comprised by what they called Mayor Nostrum. Since this was the core of the Roman Empire and around which all the administrative regions were distributed. Putinger map. During the days when all roads led to Rome, the so called Putinger map served as a handy guide to the empire's transportation network. And this map is 22 feet long and one foot wide. And it shows the course of more than 60,000 miles of Roman roads stretching from Western Europe to the Middle East. An additional section also shows India, Sri Lanka and other parts of Asia. Much like a modern travel guide, the map includes the locations of more than 500 cities along with some 3,500 other points of interest such as way stations, temples, forests, rivers and even spurs. The original map was uh, prepared something sometime around uh, 484 4th century but the version that exists today is a 13th century copy. It is named after the German scholar Pettinger who took the ownership of it in the early 1500. This is the famous Tabula Rogeriana. In 12th century AD, the renowned Muslim scholar Al Adrisi, he was invited to the court of Norman King Roger II and asked to produce a book on geography. The result was the Tabula Rogeriana, also known as a guide to pleasant journeys into faraway lands. The book featured several regional maps as well as a projection of the known world, which depicted the entity, entirety of Eurasia and a large section of Africa. By drawing from interviews with travelers and his own wanderings through the Europe, Aladrisi also compiled extensive data on the climate, politics and culture of different regions. See the connection between the cartography of the maps with the habitat and the economy and the society. It remained among the world's most accurate maps for several centuries. But it may appear strange at first glance in the tradition of Islamic cartographers, al Adrisi drew it with south positioned at the top. This is the south direction and this is the north direction. And it's not just a map of the world. It's an extensively researched geographical text that covers natural features ethnic and cultural groups, socioeconomic features and other characteristics. So these maps describe the world as a sphere, break it up into 70 different rectangular sections, mind that 70 different rectangular sections, each of which is discussed in exacting detail in the remainder of the tabula. Tabula means table. And in 100 AD came the Greek scholar Claudius Ptolemy. Ptolemy wrote his Geographia and it's a huge book and Ptolemy's map is notable for its probable role in the Roman expansion and remarkable for its breadth and detail. His idea of using a latitude and longitude system had a significant impact on the work of the later cartographers. It boasts more than 8,000 different place names as well as references to such far-flung locals as Iceland and Korea, all of which are plotted against according to geometric points of latitude and longitude. But sadly, no maps drawn by Ptolemy have survived today. His atlas seems to have disappeared for over a thousand years, and it was not until the 13th century that Byzantine scholars began making projections using his coordinates. And this is the famous map Amundi. It's a generic term for medieval European and world maps. The Hereford Mapamundi, it is noted for being the largest medieval map still in existence. It is circular in shape with Jerusalem placed at the center of the map. The Garden of Eden in a ring of fire near the top of the map and the whole thing oriented with east at the top, east at the top. Jerusalem at the center. One odd feature is that Europe is mislabeled as Africa. Though the map is circular, 
experts don't think it's evidence that cartographer believed in a flat earth. Instead, the Hereford Mappa Mundi is widely regarded as being a type of projection with the uninhabitable regions to the north and south omitted from the map. The Daming Hun Eitu, one of the earliest surviving world maps from the Far East. This is the Chinese scholar. Two, amalgamated map of the Ming Empire and is drawn on silk as early as 1389. The map spans the entire Eurasian continent from Japan to the Atlantic Ocean and includes the detailed markings of mountain ranges, rivers and administrative areas. It is particularly notable for the way in which it distorts the size of various landmasses. Mainland China sits like a monolith in the middle of the map, while Japan and Korea are both far larger than India. This is India. The African continent is depicted as a relatively small peninsula. This is Africa. With what appears to be a giant lake, this giant lake at its center. But despite these peculiarities, it is often cited as the first map to show Africa on a southern tip that can be, that could be circumnavigated. And later on, the Portuguese did so. This is Frau Mauro map in, of 1450 AD. It's considered one of the finest pieces of medieval cartography. It's large round map, around two meters in diameter, painted on vellum and stressed in a wooden frame. It depicts the known world at the time, Europe, Asia, and Africa. Try to guess from the ship, the continents there. One interesting feature is that it is oriented with south at the top. That is why you are not getting it. As opposed to the Ptolemy map, another well-known historical map as well, and he chose this orientation because he felt that Ptolemy's map is not accurate, being created based on information gleaned from the works of Ptolemy, dating from long before much of the world had been thoroughly explored. That is why he did not believe in Ptolemy. In 1500 came Marketer, Gerard das Marketer. It is notable for being the first attempt to make a round earth look like right on a flat surface, rectangular in shape. The problem inherent in representing a spherical shape on a flat plane is that things tend to get distorted. Lines of latitude and longitude useful for navigating a globe become worth and useless on a flat plane. Marketers sought to account for this by keeping the line straight, distorting the size of the objects closest to the poles. The result was the marketer projection, an invaluable tool for navigation at sea at that time. And marketer projection allowed for straight lines called loxodromes. That's the line of constant bearings. And these were easier to calculate and plot. And the navigators used this for navigation. And then came Cantino Planisphere in 1502. He was an Italian duke commissioned an agent Alberto Cantino to acquire a map of the geographic discoveries of the kingdom of Portugal, which was notorious for closely guarding the location of the new lands found by its explorers. Mind that it's a case of just stealing to acquire a map from Portuguese map and he succeeded in his mission and the map that he smuggled out of Portugal has since become famous. Not only does it depict Africa, India and Europe in unprecedented detail, this Africa, India and Europe in unprecedented detail, it stands as one of the earliest known maps to show the coastlines of Portugal's new world territories in South America. This is South America. To the north of Brazil, the map also includes a small group of islands, landmasses, that appear to be Cuba, 
Hispaniola, and part of American East Coast. Then World Simuler World Bank in 1507. He was a German cartographer and produced the first map in history to depict the new world as a distinct landmass with the Pacific Ocean on its western side. See, this is the North America, South America, West Indies, and this is Atlantic Ocean, Africa, Arab, Arabian Peninsula, India, Sri Lanka, and etc. In honor of the Italian navigator Amerigo Vespucci, who had first posited the separate continent theory, while Simuler and the collaborator Matthias Ringman dubbed these new Western Hemisphere territories America. It has since been called America's birth certificate. It bears the distinction of being the most expensive world map of all time. In 2003, the Library of Congress purchased the only surviving copy for a whopping $10 million. So 1507 map of World Simuler costs $10 million. In 1600, this is the Ricky map, known as the impossible black tulip. See, the shape is like a tulip. It was composed by Jesuit priest Matteo Ricci in 1602. It is the oldest surviving map in Chinese. To show the Americas. Again, this is a detailed picture of the Americas. Two different hemispheres, Eastern Hemisphere and the Western Hemisphere. The map shows China at the center of the earth. So after that, printing plus a big impulse in the developing of different methods of surveying and new instruments, they changed the whole locus of cartographic development. The Dark Age, followed by Industrial Revolution, Modern Period, and the domain of, uh, uh, there have been some changes, what we call as paradigm shift, that is from the figurative map into thematic map, that was one paradigm change, and from thematic map to today's special mapping for special forecasting, for special modeling using geospatial technology. This shift in technology again happened in recent times. So development of ideas, scales of measurement, weighing by importance, formulation of numerical index, aggregate score, disparity, equality, etc. It ushered a new type of mapping, maps of susceptibility, vulnerability, trafficability, sustainability, suitability, and host of similar others. And that showed a weighted composite of individual environmental measures. So the trends continue. The, in olden times, there was a a shift in technology while reproducing the maps by using colors, photochemical technology, and printing technology. And today, the whole thing has been taken over by the computer technology. So you can use a huge number of combinations of colors with more precision. We can prepare the general reference map with all details. We can prepare thematic maps, updated theoretic map, thematic maps, real-time thematic maps, showing distribution of anything on the earth surface for any particular place or any particular region like this. So today, the geographical information system, it is now called in the uh, early decades of this 21st century, 2000s, it was called geographical intelligence service. So that we cannot hide anything from the eyes of 
anybody on that surface. We can reproduce or produce maps showing whatever we want on a map from any place using the satellite technology, using remote sensing and others. And now, this special modeling, it has taken us to another level. We call it Coro Informatics. In the 20s of the this century, just in 2018-19, from this onward, uh, again, this digital technology, this uh, special modeling using special statistics has changed the processes of mapping using the different kinds of indices for the welfare of society, for the welfare and planning of our society, our region, to eliminate the special inequality or disparity. It has led us to the age of Coro Informatics. Sorry, I have taken a long time. Huh. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Is it okay for you? Thank you, sir. Was it okay for you? Yes sir. Yes sir. Yes sir. Any question? Thank you. So thank you sir. Uh, participant, if you have any question to share, please uh, you can ask now, or you can put it in the chat box. Okay, so I think uh, there is no question for uh, you, sir. So thank you, sir, uh, for your uh, wonderful, uh, uh, wonderful uh, talk on Manus, uh, cartography. Sir. Yes, sir. Manus, uh, I think there is some question in the chat box. What are the qualities? Yes, yes. Of JP Sharma, yes. JP Sharma, sir, has asked, what are the quality of a cartographer must have? Okay. Uh, I have discussed to you earlier, a cartographer needs the primary knowledge of geodesy, that is about the spherical trigonometry of the earth surface, the measurements of the earth surface. Must have a knowledge of surveying, how the surveying is done, has been done. Photogrammetry, principles of remote sensing and their applications, and obviously today, the GIS. He must have uh, must know the exact processes of selecting, selection, classification, simplification, exaggeration, and symbolization while preparing a thematic map. As because mapping involves a series of information transformation, so he must know how to reduce the amount of information loss and how to emphasize the particular uh, theme that to represent the in the thematic map. This is needed, and uh, the principles of mapping, the fundamental seven principles of map map making, must be borne in mind while producing a map. That must be must have some scale, must be uh, drawn on some particular scale. The layout of the map should be scientifically arranged. The design of the map should be. Uh, well, uh, to in the text, uh, in the um, map box, body of the map, the, the frame of the map, it is very important. And to place the north line and the scale on some portion that makes the map, uh, gives the map a beauty. 
and the, those, those lesions and the keys that should be within the box of the map. And uh, if you remember, in topographical sheets, there are different kinds of letterings for settlements. Why different kinds of letterings? Some are in small letters, some are small italics, and then uh, bold upright, bold uh, italics, and the size of the fonts they have used in uh, topographical maps, the size also differs. These are to emphasize the importance of the size of the settlements, the nature of the settlements. They use different colors to show the intensity of the distribution of the forests as well. Or while uh, mapping the water surface area, water bodies, different tints of greens have been used, blue and greens have been used to show the approximate variation in depths of the water body. Maps must have, they have a border. Uh, all kinds of lettering should be addressed in a scientific fashion, must have a title, and on the boundary, at least, there should be the position of the parallels and the meridians. And it's better, if it's a small area, there is no need to mention the particular type of projection that you have used, but they have used. But if it's a large area, we should mention the particular type of projection that has been used. And the, mm, okay, these are the contextual informations. Always a uh, cartographer must bear in mind. Any other question? Yes, sir. The, sir, uh, here another question is uh, from Sandeep Prajapati, uh, who is ask, uh, who is first maker of map? It's very difficult. It's very difficult. But uh, as I said, in ancient period, what we have discovered till now, that Babylonian plate, clay tablet, that is the oldest known map we have discovered. And in paper form, uh, I show you, in paper form, there are maps like the first map, in paper from Tabula Rogeriana in 12 AD, but before that, Puttinger map, sorry, in AD 3, 3rd century AD. That is the first map on uh, paper and the first map on silk, that is the Chinese map. All others are drawn on the hmm, paper and other wood. Today, there are some cave paintings lately, very uh, lately that uh, we have discovered in Indonesia, in America, in India also, that appear like a map, like the stick charts that have been uh, drawn or prepared by the Marshall Islanders to that facilitate the, their movement on the open waters. And the, uh, those uh, people, um, tribal people who lived in caves, they drew the maps to show their positions, to show their lifestyles, to show the area in which they live in terms of the cave paintings. And if you want to call them maps, they are also maps. Okay. Thank you. Oh, thank you, sir. There is another question uh, from Piyush Purohit. Uh, the question is, uh, what kind of projection used by Google and Bhuban? They are all, they use UTM projections, UTM reference frames, both Google okay. and Bhuban to minimize the distortions. Okay. Sir, uh, another question from Dibayan Ghosh. What are the different steps of cartography? 
different states. Though there are four processes of cartography. I told you earlier, four processes of cartography. Uh, okay. Uh, next, sir. How number one. Set? Number one. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, collecting and selecting the data for mapping. Then manipulating or designing the data, followed by designing and constructing the map. And then reading or viewing the map. And then interpreting the information on the map. So you, you uh, for drawing a map, if you want to draw a map, you must have information to display. If you want to display the raw information, it's OK. There are different methods. If you want to display the relational aspects, you find out the index values and the values of the relations and then plot them accordingly. And depending on the nature of the data, data on the index values, whether it is ordinal, whether it is categorical, whether it is ratio or it is interval data, choose the particular method that is suitable for displaying the information. And there are different ways you can uh, use a color patch map, color patch mapping, or you can use dot method. You can use isoplate. You can draw isoplates. You can show through choroplate mapping. You can draw cartograms. You can draw uh, a trend surface map. You can draw uh, show the dist uh, distribution through diagrammatic maps using geometric figures, proportional geometric figures. These are the ways to show. Thank you, sir. Mm. Uh, sir, there is another question. How remote sensing is important in cartography? Natural remote sensing is most important. You cannot perform survey, ground survey in remote areas, in inaccessible terrains. So you must take the help of the satellite images. And from remote sensing survey, there is a particular way the surveying is done. And the information is extracted with precision and correcting all those informations and then using software for mapping. Without remote sensing, it's very difficult today to uh, find the most updated map, real-time map. In our times, when we were students, supposing we went to a field, went to for a field study. And we then managed to have maps from the offices there. So in 1990, what base map we have found, the base map was prepared in 1900 or 1928 or 1978. So these are all old maps that did not show the updated information. And we had to use those and do the uh, required corrections and today remote sensing or the google image bobon image they give you all the recent details you can draw maps using your own intelligence okay sir uh, there is an uh, query uh, from bizar lakshmi uh, he wanted to ask you how to correlate the map scale with resolution of satellite imagery uh, I mean, how to decide the scale and also how does the area affect the scale? Hmm. When you are taking the help of while producing a map, uh, if you take the help of a particular software, they are doing this in the back platform. They are taking a particular scale of uh, exaggeration and you had to choose while applying using a particular software which kind of projection you are going to use so that projection principles of that projection the back end of the computer calculations at disk the calculation has been done and the final product is appears on your screen but in our days supposing i'm doing a plane table survey for a small village, a plane table survey followed by a leveling and a theodolite survey. Again, for trigonometrical leveling. 
or I can take the help of modern GIS, a GPS to locate the points. If I know the coordinates of all these points, if I can calculate this, I can just plot the points on a Cartesian coordinate system to find out the locations and to obtain the a map, in fact. And the scale is simply the ratio between distance says on the map and the distance on the ground. That is the ratio by which the whole thing is being transformed. For a small area, the resolution will not be lost. The area will almost remain same. But if it is on the continent scale, if it is on big country scale like Africa, continent scale, sorry, there will be errors. There will be errors in area. You will have to choose a particular equal area projection, otherwise there will be area aerial distortions. And if you want to show the continent with perfect shape, there will definitely be distortions in area. In case of smaller areas, this is almost equal to 1 is to 0 0.9996 or 1 is to 1 1.00010. So there will be very, very little 1 in 10,000 uh, will be the plus minus will be the error only. That is negligible for small areas. Okay. Okay, sir. Uh, the other question uh, from Saurabh Haldar. How maps were made in old days? Oh, how much old? That is also a question. Is it the ancient period or the old like uh, historical past? If it is historical past. Yes, sir. Uh, is in historical, oh, ancient, historical period. Past. ancient period. Okay. They used roshis in our country, ropes of particular length. They used horses, paces of the horses to find out the distance between two points. The pace of the horse has a particular measurement. And you just count the number of paces, you will get the distance. Although plus minus some error will always be there. But if you see the temples of our country, ancient temples in South India, Central India, Northern India, these temples must have been drawn according to a particular plan. And it's a very sad situation. We have not been able till now to discover the original plan. Badami, Hampi, and uh, Lepakshi. All, all these are drawn, even the Bihars, Buddhist mon monasteries. They have been placed in a particular location, best suited location at that time for a particular purpose. And the structures have been laid out on a particular scale. Uh, and their organization is very scientifically uh, with, uh, arranged in it very with a scientific mind as well they they used only the ropes they used their own ingenious way of drawing a square in the field drawing a rectangle in the field drawing a circle in the field and even drawing a ellipse in the field they have their own way. The Mughals, they have their own art of producing, building the arches. That is their structure. So these plans we have not been able to discover till now. So only we can presume the equipment available at that time, what the history says, is the basis of the horses for finding the distances and there was obviously 
some errors in directions. Okay. Sir, thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I think uh, there is uh, no another question. So thank you, sir. Uh, thank you again for your uh, wonderful talk. And I think just like me, uh, all the particip participants are also very fortunate uh, to hear you uh, on uh, the whole about the cartography and map making and uh, another uh, the other uh, thing uh, you uh, just show uh, to us today and uh, you delivered so thank you again um, uh, for your uh, wonderful uh, lecture sir and uh, i hope just like me uh, we all cultivate uh, the advice uh, the thing which you shown over and thank you uh, sir so now i request uh sir the chairman of sire to say few word, uh, words here Thank you, Manush. Uh, first of all, I would like to give special thanks to my teacher, my mentor, and also my beloved, uh, respected teacher, Professor Ashish Shorka, sir, for joining with us in our platform. And I'm really sorry, sir. Actually, I have to conduct two programs simultaneously in collaboration with either NIV and also uh, that's why I did not completely focus on your lecture but yes we have recorded version we will definitely follow and we also we will share this recorded version as a digital archive to all our participants and uh, regarding your topic your lecture i don't have any right to say any comments or anything but you are uh, what i feel the students of geography those who are uh, under your umbrella has learned something as I got an opportunity to learn something, they know very well that you are one of an institution in geography. You are individually an institution in geography. So today we are honored that in these two days, uh, two weeks national geospatial training where the regional persons have joined from the different ministries, the participants have joined from the different verticals. They uh, today and also we can get an opportunity to hear you on the basic GIS, basic before car, GIS remote sensing, the basic cartography and its map making system also. So thank you, sir, once again, and hope in future we will also get the assistance and also the participants. Once again, I would like to give you thanks. You will get all the recorded versions, recorded lectures from uh, our side by tonight and hope you will enjoy all the sessions in the coming days also like previous and what i saw uh arvind sir are you here dr varshne are you here sir okay so thank you once again Thank you for joining with us, and very soon we will meet. Okay, so thank you all. Uh, and uh, now I will stop uh, today's session here and uh, to request you all to join tomorrow in the same time as before. And uh, I hope uh, you will join the sessions, upcoming sessions. So take care, uh, stay well. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Hello, Manos. Hello. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, I would like to say something, please. Okay, okay, sir, please. Sir, please. Sir, please. Sir, please. Sir, please, sir, please unmute yourself. I will send you the PDF of this presentation. Okay, Manush, can you hear me?
okay yes sir yes sir right. i can hear you uh, okay this presentation okay. you can share the presentation with all the participants okay okay sir okay, so sir. that they will have a hard copy for okay. future reference okay sir okay thank you very much i'll send, thank uh, you, send you tomorrow sir. tomorrow i'll oh, send okay, you tomorrow okay 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 thank you thank you thank you very much thank you, thank you.